All right, welcome back to The Effect. We are still talking about other methods that we have not covered so far in the book. And again, we're just gonna do brief overviews of these. I'm not gonna go deep into the technical details. If you wanna know more, read the chapter. Uh, and then also, if you like, maybe you can look at some of the uh, other resources that the chapter links to. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about new methods for modeling heterogeneous treatment effects. So we talked about heterogeneous treatment effects all the way back in chapter 10. This is the idea that different individuals are going to be affected differently by the treatment. Now, in that chapter, we said, okay, different people are affected individually, and then that what the real question and problem became is, how do we know what our single estimate represents? Is it an average treatment effect over averaging over everybody's treatment effect? Is it an average treatment on the treated, getting the average effect just among people who actually got the treatment? Is it a local average treatment effect that's, uh, that focuses on people who respond more heavily to assignments to treatment? All that sort of stuff, right? That was the real question. We're going to get a single estimate. What does that estimate represent? But why do we got to get a single estimate? Why not just get a different estimate for everybody, right? We could have a different estimate for you and me and my friend and my neighbor and da 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 da, da right? Why not? Now we covered two different ways of trying to estimate heterogeneous treatment effects before. We talked about interaction terms, which allow you to interact the treatment with different sets of predictors so that you can see how the treatment effect varies across those groups that you have. Now that's great if you are really, really particularly interested in how the treatment effect varies across a specific group, um, but it's a little bit limited. You can't really allow for the full range of treatment effects. It would get too busy too quickly. We also talked about hierarchical linear modeling. Uh, which is a way of using random effects to allow the effect to vary across different characteristics in a much smoother way than uh, interaction terms would allow for. Uh, this is handy. It allows you to see the distribution of the effect. Uh, but we're also going to look at some other ways, uh, specifically coming from machine learning, that we can use to actually estimate the full range of exact estimates for each individual person. I want to be able to say, hey, you, your estimate is 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 8. That's not an actual number, but you know what I mean. All right, the first one we're going to cover is called the causal forest. Now, if you're into data science and machine learning, you are probably familiar with the random forest. And the random forest is a predictive model that's not really concerned with causal inference. I'll, you could use it for double machine learning, like we talked about in the last video. But here is how it works. You start with all of your data. You've got a bunch of variables that you're going to use to predict some sort of outcome, right? And so you're going to look through all of your variables and all the different values of your variables, and you're going to use all those to split your data into two. So you might say, okay, got a, I got a bunch of predictive variables. I'm trying to predict your income. I'm going to say, okay, the first I'm going to compare men to women. And then I'm going to compare people who are above and below the ages of 24. And then above and below the ages of 25. And then above and below the ages of 26. And I'm going to compare people in this state versus that state, right? All these different comparisons, just splitting the data into two groups. Then I'm going to pick the split that best maximizes my predictive power. Right, so if the biggest difference, the biggest two group split that I can make is between men and women, then I will split men and women separately. Now I've got two different sets of data. I've split the tree, I started with the sort of a node, I split it into a tree that has two branches on it. Then I will repeat the process. Here's the men over here. For the men, I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna compare above age 25 to below age 25, above age 26 to below age 26. I'm gonna compare people who are this race versus that race. I'm gonna da, da, da. All the different comparisons I can make, I'm gonna make another split over here. I'm gonna go back to women over here. I'm gonna do another split over here and another split and another split. And now I'm gonna split the data into tiny little chunks. And then I'm gonna make a prediction about each individual based on where they fall in the tree. And then of course I will do this whole process over and over again. I will randomly include and leave out different predictors. That's all the details of running a random forest. But this works pretty well. This process works pretty well for doing predictions, right? If I want to predict what your outcome is going to be, I'm going to look at the 8,000 different, different splits that I just made and different trees that I grew. And I'm going to put your spots based on following your split. So you are a man above the age of 25 and you, uh, you know, your hair is five inches long and we follow down the list until we find where you are. That's your prediction. Causal forests are the exact same idea. We're still doing splits. We're still running through all the different variables and splitting them and seeing the best split that we can find. And we're still doing it over and over again to split our data into tinier and tinier chunks. The only difference is instead of basing the split on trying to improve our predictive power, we are basing the split on the difference in the causal effect that we estimate. So I'm trying to estimate this time. I'm not trying to predict your income. I'm trying to predict uh, the effect of getting a college degree on your income. Right. So I'm going to look at the split. Maybe I'll look at men and women first. And I'll say, okay, among men, uh, what is the correlation between getting a college degree and your income? What is the correlation between, for women between getting a college degree and your income? And I'm going to compare those two correlations. I'm going to see how different they are. And then I will compare the, do that same comparison, see how different the correlations are across many different splits. I'm going to try to pick the split that maximizes the difference in those effects. Now, once I've done this, I've sort of packed together a bunch of tiny little groups that all have very similar treatment effects, and then I therefore I can estimate the treatment effect 
just for them. And by seeing where you fall in the tree, I can see what your individual treatment effect is going to be. Causal Forest is very nice as a way of estimating these heterogeneous treatment effects. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, it has a lot of power. You can use a lot of different predictors, um, although you don't want to go too overboard. And also, it has the very nice property that the individual treatment effects that we estimate have standard errors that we can calculate. A lot of the time when you get into machine learning methods, you don't get standard errors, and so it's difficult to make proper statistical inferences from them. But causal forests, yeah, we get standard errors, so we can estimate that sort of thing. So causal forests are actually a pretty popular way of estimating heterogeneous treatment effects. Let's move on to one that has found a lot less purchase so far, but I think is kind of cool, and that is sorted effects. So I talked about interaction terms as being a way of estimating heterogeneous treatment effects, but I also said you can't really just toss a bunch of interaction terms in there because you're not going to be able to interpret things very well. It's going to get kind of noisy. Well, what sorted effects does is it says, find any way that you can of estimating heterogeneous treatment effects in your regression model. Add a whole bunch of interaction terms. Maybe add some nonlinearities in there, right? Some polynomials, whatever. Now, if we do this, we can estimate for each individual person what their individual treatment effect is. If I interact treatment with gender and race and state and area and height and uh, the length of your hair and all this sort of stuff, get all these interaction terms, uh, I can get the effect of the, of the treatment by taking the derivative of the regression model as we did back in our interaction terms video. And I can see for you individually, once I plug in all these variables, what your individual effect is. It's still a bit difficult to really interpret there, but what they do is they say, we're gonna predict the individual effect for every person, and then we're going to sort of graph out what the distribution of the effects is. And you might get a graph that looks a bit like this, uh, where you can see that even though the average effect is something like 0.07, uh, for different individuals, the effect varies wildly from something like 0.02 all the way up to 0.1. We also get a standard error on what the effect is at every different uh, quantile of the effect. Uh, so we get a nice distribution of effects, and even better, uh, we can see who is in different parts of the distribution. That's something that's a little bit harder to do with hierarchical linear modeling, although you can do it. So you can do things like, say, look at this effect right here. So here we are looking at the effect of being uh, recommended vitamin E on whether or not you take vitamin E, and we are interacting that with some things like how much exercise you get, whether you smoke or not, uh, your vitamin behavior score, I don't actually know exactly what that is. Um, but you can look in the distribution of effects that you got and see who happens to sit in the most affected and least affected bin. And here we see that among people who do not respond to the vitamin E recommendation, 100% of them smoke. And among the people who really strong, respond really strongly, none of them smoke. That's a big difference. It allows you to do things like describe the kinds of people who respond strongly to treatment and the kinds of people who don't, which can be really important if you're doing trying to do something like, hey, I want to know not just what is the effect of this policy, but how does that effect differ across different groups of people? All right, those are two ways that you can use to model heterogeneous treatment effects, to be able to try to get the individual treatment effect for each individual person. Now, I do want to point something out that neither of these are magic. Uh, both of these assume that you have some way of identifying the causal effect of interest, and then after you pass that hurdle, which is the kind of thing we've been talking about through the rest of the book, then it will let you model the heterogeneous treatment effect, right? Just running something like causal forest does not guarantee that your results are causal. They're only causal if you think that the relationship that you're splitting over, right, when you split the data and you get the correlation here and the correlation here, if that correlation is a causal effect. If it's not, then you're not really getting the causal effect, right? So you need to be sure that you are actually getting the causal effect before you try to estimate heterogene heterogeneity in that causal effect. But that said, this stuff is still really cool. I think that modeling heterogeneous treatment effects is one of the things that machine learning can really contribute to causal inference because it's really good at getting all those fine little details and getting specific individual stuff and predictions and effects for each individual person. I think that's one of the places that we're gonna see a lot of growth in the near future as we see more machine learning influence in causal inference. All right, that is it for this chapter. And then coming up next is the very last chapter of the book. We are almost done. Thank you. Mm -hmm.